Hey everyone, this is Pete. And it's been a little while since I've done some Atari 8-bit stuff, so I thought it might be a nice change to uh, do something a little bit different with it. Um, one thing that I've mentioned a few times over the course of the Atari A to Z series and, uh, and, and various other things is the prevalence of public domain software that there was throughout the 8 and 16-bit home computer eras in particular. So one thing I thought it would be quite interesting to do is to take a look at the Page 6 public domain library which is a vast library of disks for both Atari ST and Atari 8-bit uh, that contains public domain software, some of which is from magazines, some of which is from user groups, some of which was just submitted directly to page six. And the way this worked is that the software itself was free, uh, but you would pay page six, like I think it was like three or four quid or something like that per disk um, for them to duplicate uh, and also make a little bit of profit on it as well that they would then plug straight back into the magazine as well. And with so many disks available in the Page 6 public domain library uh, by the end of Page 6's lifespan, it became a, a nice little side business for them that was very much appreciated by a lot of Atari owners because um, working on these old systems, you didn't have access to things like the internet. A lot of people didn't even have modems and access to bulletin boards and such like. So this was one of their main ways of acquiring free software. Uh, so these days you just go on the, on the internet and, and download something. Um, but this was one of the primary means of acquiring free software um, that, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was just a great way of, of getting new games and applications and utilities and expansions for things and so on. All things we take for granted today, but back in the 80s in particular, when people were not connected online with their home computers, or at least not everyone was, um, yeah, this, this was a very important lifeline to a lot of people and also the way that a lot of programmers got started, got noticed, all sorts of things like that. So um, there are nearly 300 disks in the page six public domain library plus a bunch of extra um sort of special collections and so on we're not going to go through every one of them um because some of them are just utilities that won't make particularly interesting videos or or that i don't have the hardware to to take advantage of um but we are going to start at the beginning today uh, with disc number one and if you want to follow along and try these for yourself if you go to page six.org um all of these old collections have been archived in Atari disk image format for you to try for yourself. So the first disk that we're going to try today is number one in the collection, the first one that was released. It's called the Myria Collection, uh, and it describes itself as a good selection from simulations to arcade games. Myriapede is one of the best public domain programs and is worth the price of several disks together. Mastermind is one of the best versions around. The complete listing. Myria is brilliant, just brilliant, 100% machine language centipede type game. Shell is a graphics demo. Clouseau is a de text detective mystery. Ball, another GTIA demo. Civil War, an American Civil War simulation. Cone, a GTIA demo. Luna lets you land on the moon. Dizzy is a GTIA demo. Mastermind is an excellent version of the classic Mastermind game. Munchers is by Stan Ockers, don't get chomped. With spirals, you can draw super patterns and pack demos are designed for Pac-Man and ghosts. In Concentre, you match the squares. Eggs is for youngsters. Logo is the Atari logo with 256 colors, and colors shows you Atari's full color palette. So, um, yeah, lots of things to have a look at here. So we're not gonna to spend too long on each of them, but we will have a, a quick look at each and see what's on this disc. Um, and then if you wanna find out a bit more, you can try it for yourself very easily. So, we'll be right back in a moment once we've loaded up this disc. Okay, here we are with disc one of the page six library. So this is a standard title screen that they had on pretty much all of the discs in the collection. The page six library consists of programs collected from users and user groups in the USA, Australia, and Great Britain. And to the best of our knowledge, all programs are in the public domain. So I press start for menu. So I'll then take a moment to read all the files. And we press start to go to the menu, select option, press start, run basic program or display directory. So here we are. So this is the menu system for the page six library disks. Uh, at the start, you've got continue, which just takes you onto the next screen. Uh, you've got basic, which takes you to basic. Your DOS, which takes you to DOS. Uh, title, menu, uh, 
and then Myria is our first one that we want to take a look at. So let's hit start on that one and try Myria. Use DOS option L to load Myria. Okay. All right, so to do that then we want to go DOS. It wants us to do this because Myria is a machine code program uh, that normally you would load uh, from DOS rather than um, rather than as a basic program. So what we do is we press L for load and we type Myria. That will take a moment to load that in. And then we can play Myria 1.1, copyright 1982 by Landon Dyer. This software is in the public domain, do not something or other. All right. Let's begin. Oh, what did that say? Use option and select to choose game options. Press start to start game. Something going a bit funny with this. <laughs> it only seems to uh, sort of display that menu when I hold down one of the keys for some reason. That's very strange. How odd. Bear with me a moment, I'll be right back. Okay, not sure what's going on there, but uh, here we are. This is Myriapede, which is, as you can see, a clone of Centipede. Actually a pretty good one as well. It's a little bit slower than Centipede, but it does move very smoothly. Whoops, there's some nice sound effects. Some which are very much the same ones that Atari used in their own port of Centipede. The control scheme does take a little bit of getting used to, in that there's this there's this heavy sort of acceleration on uh, your ship. So the longer you hold down a direction, the faster your ship will move in that direction. Oops. And that takes a, a bit of adjusting too. But that's presumably intended to sort of simulate um, the trackball controls and how you'd sort of s spin up the trackball on the original arcade machine to, oh dear. Uh, you'd spin up the trackball in the original arcade machine to uh, move across the screen more quickly. And as you can see, there's actually an impressive amount of features from the original Centipede in this game. We've got the fleas falling down the screen, we've got the spider, we've got the earwig thing poisoning the mushrooms, we've got the mushrooms themselves. We've got the variable scoring according to how close you are to the spider when you shoot it. Whoops. Yeah, the only thing that, that holds this back slightly for me compared to the to Atari's own ports of Centipede is the, the slightly sluggish controls. It's like just if, if the starting speed that it moved at was just a little bit quicker and a little bit more responsive, I think this would be this would be better. But aside from that, it's certainly a very, very competent centipede clone. Oh dear. See that that's the other problem with the sort of acceleration on there is sometimes you can end up sort of sliding into things that you don't want to slide into. <laughs> Thank you. 
But yeah, when you consider that this is this is free, rather than asking you to pay however much Atari were charging for the cartridge version of Centipede, which is probably around the 40 quid mark, even in the early 80s, then yeah, you, you can see why these, you can see why public domain software was popular. Because it provided a great means of getting your hands on high quality software for next to nothing. Or indeed actually nothing. If you were in a position to be able to get this software from user groups or bulletin boards and such like. I'm not sure of the origins of this program, whether it was just written as a machine code program, or if it was, um, or if it was originally a type in listing or something. Anyway, that is Miria Pete. So let's hit the reset button, and uh, head back to the menu. All right, what else have we got? So Clouseau, I think it said was a text adventure. So we'll just have a little look at this one. Inspector Clouseau, Bill, Mary, John, Susie and Paul are house guests. Their host was murdered by one of them between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Your job as Inspector Clouseau is to find the killer, time and room. You will be given a floor plan of the house and a set of questions for the suspects, but the guilty person may try to mislead you by lying some of the time. If one of the suspects claimed that the host was already dead or that the host was still alive, you have found the room where the murder took place. When asking questions, be sure to enter data in uppercase only. So this sounds like a twist on Cluedo. Um, but let's, let's have a quick look at how it all works. Note that only rooms which have doors, marked slash or backslash, are considered adjacent. When a suspect says he or she was with someone, this means that they were in the same room. When a suspect says he or she saw someone, that means that person was in an adjacent room. It is suggested that you have a notepad to record the answers to the questions you ask of your suspect. If you wish to end the game, enter the totally baffled option. Okay, Inspector, who is your suspect? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember their names. Paul. You wish to question Paul about the suspect's whereabouts at a particular time, what time the suspect was in a certain room, or the crime is solved. The suspect's whereabouts at a particular time. Paul, where were you at nine? I was in the lounge room. I was with John. Inspector, who is your suspect? Totally baffled. No. Uh, all right, John. Where were you at nine? I was in the lounge room with Paul. Okay. Uh, John, where were you at 10? Oh, that was too late, isn't it? Where were you at 7? I was in the living room. I saw Mary. Mary, where were you at 7? I was in the atrium room. I saw Susie. I saw John. Susie. Where were you at seven? I was in the lounge room. I saw Mary. Hmm, she should have seen John as well. Interesting. Uh, Susie? Susie, when were you in the lounge? I was in that room at two. I was in that room at seven. Inspector, who is your suspect? Okay, this actually looks like quite a neat game. Um, but um, <laughs> it is a bit dependent on you having actually uh, bothered to write things down. So um, I tell you what, I'm going to reboot and we're going to have a quick go at this properly. We're not necessarily going to solve the entire case, but what I will do is I'll make some notes as I go along and see if we can figure anything out. Uh, I will also write down the names of all the characters this time. But. 
Right, Cluso. Right, so we have Bill, Mary, John, Susie, and Paul. Um, and between 1 and 9 p.m. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Doing this properly with a pen. Right. Um, so floor pen of the house, there is the make a note of that so dining room trophy room garage lounge atrium and living room so dining room and living room connect to each other atrium and living room connect to each other Atrium and lounge connect to each other. Uh, trophy room and garage connect to each other. And dining room and trophy room connect to each other. Uh, there's a, now there's a gap between the lounge and the garage, but there's no door marked in it. Does that mean they are connected or they aren't connected? Let's, let's, let's put a question mark there for that. Okay. Right. We are ready to begin. Inspector, who is your suspect? All right, let's start with Bill. Bill, where were you at one o'clock? So, Bill says he was in the atrium at one. And he says he was with Paul. He also says he saw Mary, um, he saw Susie, and he saw John. So that means that Susie, John, and Mary should be in either the living room or the lounge at that time. Okay, well, let's let's confirm Paul's whereabouts, first of all. So, Paul, where were you at one o'clock? Right, so Paul's story backs up Bill's story. So, assuming he's not lying, that's fine. So Mary, Susie, and John. Let's find out where, where they, they were. So Mary, where were you at one o'clock? So Mary claims she was in the lounge with Susie. which would fit with what we've seen. And she saw Bill and Paul, who were in the atrium at the time. Uh, so let's just check what Susie says. Okay. All right, so any person unaccounted for then is John. John, where were you at one? The host was still alive. I was in the living room. I saw Bill, I saw Paul. Okay, so no one appears to be lying there. No one appears to be lying there. So let's move on to two o'clock. Bill says he was in the living room at two o'clock. <coughs> Excuse me. And that he was with Paul. It's a little something going on with Bill and Paul, I think. And he saw Mary. Okay, so Mary. Mary says she was in the dining room. 
or the ding room as I've just written on my paper. If she's still Bill and Paul. Okay, so that seems to back that up, but let's just confirm with Paul. Paul, where were you? At two. Our host was still alive. I was in the trophy room. Ah, interesting. Someone is lying. All right, so you saw Mary, Susie, and John. Bill claims he was with John in the living room, but John claims he was in the trophy room. And that you saw Mary, Susie, and John. Okay, so... He would have been able to see Mary from the trophy room if she was in the dining room. Let's see where Susie and John were. All right. Okay, so Paul or Bill are telling Porkies. Bill, where were you at three o'clock? Bill claims he was in the lounge at three with John. Well, what does John have to say for himself? I was in the lounge room, I was with Bill. Okay. And he saw Mary. Okay, so where was Mary? I was in the atrium room. I saw Bill, I saw Susie, I saw John. So, Bill and John are accounted for there. Susie should be somewhere connected to the atrium. And she was in the living room, so that makes sense. And what about Paul? Paul was in the dining room. Which seems to be correct. Okay, let's look at four o'clock. Bill, where were you at four? You were in the dining room. Written ding again. With Mary, supposedly. And he saw John. Mary, where were you at four o'clock? In the dining room with Bill. Also saw John. John, where were you at four o'clock? In the trophy room. And Bill saw Mary, okay. Susie, where were you at four o'clock? In the lounge. With Paul. Supposedly. Paul. Where were you at four o'clock? The host was already dead. I was in the dining room. Interesting. So he claims he was with Bill and Mary in the dining room and that he saw John in the trophy room, presumably. But Susie claims he was in the lounge. All right, Susie, what time were you in the living room? I was in that room at three. Susie, what time were you in the lounge? She was in there at one, four, six, and nine. Okay, and then Paul. What time were you in the living room? He was in that room at three. No, that's the wrong room. Lounge, living room. They're the same thing.
Now he's in that room at one. But you said you were in the trophy room at one. Paul, where were you at one o'clock? I'm confused. The host was already... Paul, you think you know the killer? Killer is Paul. You have the killer. Inspector, who's your suspect? Uh, right, so I think... It was at two o'clock. In the trophy room. You're a bumbling idiot. Try again, you fool. Okay, all right. Uh, three. All right, time of the matter, two o'clock. You have the right time. Okay. Paul. So just got to get the room. So Paul said he was in the living room. You have the room. You're a brilliant Inspector Clouseau. It took you 28 questions and four confrontations. Do you want a new case, Inspector? No. Great. Okay, so that's Clouseau. That's a neat little game. Sorry, just put my hand over the camera now. Stop it shaking around. Yeah, that's a neat little game. I was expecting that to be more of a text adventure, but no, it's, it's, it was more of a sort of deduction game. That's fun. All right, Civil War. I'm not counting on being able to get very far with this one because I don't really do war games, but we'll see. Civil War simulation. Do you want a description? Yes. This is a Civil War simulation. To play, type a response when the computer asks. Remember that all factors are interrelated and that your responses could change history. Facts and figures used are based on the actual occurrence. Most battles tend to result as they did in the Civil War, but it all depends on you. The object of the game is to win as many battles as possible. I return to continue. Your defensive strategies are artillery attack, fortification against a frontal attack, fortification against flanking maneuvers, or falling back. I don't know. Two. Your offensive strategies are artillery attack. You are the Confederacy. Good luck. You may surrender by typing 5 for your strategy. To print this list while playing, type 6 for your strategy. This is the Battle of Bull Run. General Beauregard, commanding the South, met the Union forces with General McDowell in a premature battle at Bull Run. General Jackson helped push back the Union attack. Uh, okay, how much do you wish to spend for food? I, I have no idea. I have... Actually, no idea. Uh, uh, 18,000. A dollar per man. Salaries, a dollar per man. Ammunition, a dollar per man. Morale is fair. You are on the defensive. Your strategy, uh, artillery. Casualties, 2,304. Uh, yeah, we lost that one. <laughs> Your casualties are 70% more than the actual casualties that Bull Run. You lose Bull Run. This is the Battle of Shiloh. Shiloh. The Confederate surprise attack at Shiloh failed due to poor organisation. Okay. How much do you wish to spend for food? Uh, 50 grand. Batteries, 50 grand. Ammunition. Morale is fair. You are on the offensive. Your strategy. Uh, let's do number four. Your casualties were 3% more than the actual casualties at Shiloh. You lose Shiloh. Okay, I think I get the idea of this. Um, doesn't seem to be a ton of strategy there. This seems to be more type in the right numbers and then pick the right option. <laughs> and then that's it. So... I don't know, maybe there's more to it than that, but uh, yeah, that doesn't 
that doesn't sort of fill me with uh, confidence. Let's have a look at the... Yeah, so this is all written in basic. So, I mean, if, if you studied this, you could probably work it out. Yeah, there's a bunch of data statements there that if you if you can pass those if you can pass those you'll know what the optimal strategies are yes yeah, so there's a fair few, fair few battles to do but yeah ultimately it is just a case of it is just a case of typing in the right numbers Okay, well, it's it's something. It's something. All right. What else we got? Luna. Let's see what this is all about. I'm expecting a Luna Lander clone. Certainly looks like a Lunar Lander clone already. Oop. I have died. <laughs> Forward, new mission. There we go, right. So very jerky movement here, but it, it is sort of taking into account all the things that you would need in the Lunar Lander game, so like your horizontal and vertical velocity and so on. So if we try and land on this sort of flat bit here, oh can we, oh that out of fuel, <laughs> alright let's try it again. They don't overdo the thrusting. That's what she said, I know. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. God, you chew through that fuel incredibly quickly. Do we bounce off the top of the screen? No, we just disappear off the top of the screen. Out of time? This is impossible. <laughs> Alright, can we just take off and then land again? land back on the surface. Can we do that? Is it kind enough to let us do that? Nope. Let's have some new terrain. So I, sh I assume it wants us to land between those two dots. Let's give it a bunch of thrust to begin with. So we can get off the ground and then over here and then that should hopefully be enough to fling us over that mountain all right we are coming back down now there we are almost ideally positioned i have got any fuel left though out of time. This game is absolutely impossible. All right, let's try it one more time now. I feel like we had something there. So a bit of thrust and a bit of thrust over to the right as well. And we just need to sort of hop over that mountain without wasting all the time to 
Oh no! Alright, again, I got this. Alright, gonna run out of fuel. Let gravity do the work. No, you just don't have enough time to do that. That's insane. One more try. Oh. The fire button just starts over. Maybe another game. Right. Up. And over. Come on, clear it. That's it. Alright, slow that horizontal velocity. Down to zero, if you please. There we go! Done it! Alright, let's never play that ever again. <laughs> That's not bad, actually. I mean, it's it's very slow and sluggish, but once you sort of figure out how it handles and how, how the different adjustments affect your velocity in the different directions, yeah, that works. That works surprisingly nicely, despite its fairly ugly presentation all right we finished the first page so on to the next page so next one is mastermind which i think we can probably all predict what this is going to be please select game then press start game one will do nicely thank you very much okay so okay so we move left and right to pick a thing and then up to change its color and then fire to submit right so black is presumably one in the right place two in the wrong place and two that aren't right at all okay so let's try changing these around a bit Right, so I think that first orange one is correct. Hmm. Oops. It's annoying you can't go back through the sequence. Okay, well, how, how else can this go then? Does one of the purpley ones go first? Oh, interesting. Okay, so I think one of these is right, and then this is something else, maybe? Right, so those two are right. And then everything else is wrong. Made a terrible mistake. I thought the orange was in the right place, but it's not. It's all gone horribly wrong. So that purple's got to be right. Right? 
And then is that green right? Da. Ah. Okay, well, fair enough. That's a competent enough mastermind game. Uh, again, probably written in basic, so the controls are a little bit sluggish in that, and it would have been nice if they'd put in a downwards joystick control for you to be able to go back through the sequence of colours, but other than that, it does the job. Does the job perfectly well. Alright, next up we have spirals. I think this is just a, a demo of some sort, if I remember what it said correctly. So it's like a, it's a spirograph, basically. Running in the uh, Atari's high res mode. So two colors. Somewhere in the region of 320 by 200, I think is the resolution. Might be 320 by 180 or something like that. But yeah, this, this sort of demo is quite a common thing to see um, on the Paychex public domain library discs because it was just it was just people showing off how they could use their computer in various ways to create pieces of artwork or pretty patterns or something like that. And then if you wanted to, you could look at the basic program that this was made from, uh, list it out yourself and see how the effect was created. Okay, then it just starts again and does it on a, a different color screen. Okay, so if we list that. Spirals by Ron Baxter, published by Atari Computer Enthusiast, New South Wales. Yeah, so you can see that there's some basic code here. There's some, oh, it's a very short program. Yeah. So, I mean, it is what it is. But stuff like that was an important part of people learning how to use their computer because they would they would get these programs either by typing them in from magazines or from public domain um, discs like this. Um, and by studying those programs and looking at how they achieved various tasks, um, they would learn how to do things for themselves. That's certainly what I did back in the day. I, I learned a hell of a lot about basic programming from looking at other people's programs. Enter player one name. Beat. Bam. Please wait. It's bum to play. Is this joystick controlled? Let's find out. It is not. Uh, okay, how do we control this? I don't know. Press every key on the keyboard. You probably need joystick two for this, don't we? It probably is joystick controlled, but I only have one joystick plugged in. Uh, bear with me, I'll be right back. There we go, let's see if this works. There we go, right. Okay, and Bum picks that one. It's not a match. Then it's Pete's go. It's a match. Does Pete get another go? He does get another go. Okay, so th these are all done with um, graphic zero characters. I forgot what the. There we go. Um, oh, it's a match for Bum. Yeah, the, these are all done with control characters. Um, so this whole game runs in graphics mode zero. 
which is the Atari 8-bit's main text mode. Oh, that was a wild card. Interesting. Bad luck, bum. Now Pete's going to claim that one. Yes. That was there, yeah. Good, good. Oh, so close. So close, but not correct. What was there? A circular thing. Or a wild card. But I'm getting real lucky with those. Now, I've already matched the other little O. So, how does that work then? I don't know. Guess we'll find out. Oh, I saw that. Where was that? Right there? No. Nope. Yes, please. Next. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Where haven't we been? There? Nope. That's where that is, though. Who will win in this thrilling match between Pete and Bum? My money's on Bum. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, okay. So if, so if they don't match, the, the leftovers are just there. All right. Again, that's a perfectly confident concentration game. Would have perhaps been nice if it did something a bit more interesting with the colours, because that's just the default uh, Atari screen colours. A um, bit of sound would be nice as well. But again, the nice thing, this is a basic program. So if you want to put that stuff in, you just hit break. You go list and you go, right, where's stuff happening? And then you put you put that in yourself. Easy as that. All right, onwards to logo. I think this was just a demo again. Uh, let's have a look. It's an Atari logo. Oh, with some headache inducing visuals. Yeah, enjoy that. Oh, you can't. Can't quit that either. Reboot. <laughs> they trapped the brake key on that one. All right, what is next? Shell. Another demo, if I remember rightly. Yeah, another high res demo. You can tell by those sort of jaggedy lines. Again, just an example of how you can use mathematics to create various pleasing patterns. Shell by Greg Ramsey. Well done, Greg Ramsey. Does that do anything other than that? Oh, interesting. Yeah, right. See how the 
the text is confined to that little window in the bottom. This is one of the graphics modes where there's the there's a graphics window at the top and a text window at the bottom. Um, so you can effectively sort of have two graphics modes on screens at once. So if we go back to graphics mode zero, we can then see it a bit more. Clearly, listening to Shell Demo with Greg Ramsey, another one from Atari Computer Enthusiasts from New South Wales. And there we go, another another short one. Um, but interestingly, interestingly, he found a way to overlay text on those graphics, which is quite a clever thing to do. I won't pretend to understand how he did that, but well, there it is. Uh, then we have ball. Which I suspect is another demo. You notice they put all the games first on the disc. Which makes sense, because that's probably going to be the main attraction for most people coming to these. So yeah, this is just going to be another example of using mathematical functions to draw things. But will it animate? That is the question. Place your bets now, please. Place your bets now on if it's going to animate. It is. There we go. So that animation is just achieved through some fairly straightforward color cycling, I think. Or is it it's actually changing the the patterns as well? Yeah, hard to tell. But anyway, it's it's the ball. And again, all you need to do if you want to figure out how it's done. Original author Undone, modified by Gary Francis, published by Atari Computer Enthusiasts from New South Wales. And another very short program that has rather a pleasing outcome. So you see, this, this is the joy of these discs. This is the sort of stuff you... This is the sort of stuff that doesn't get covered in sort of retrospectives of, of old platforms because there's no real sort of historical record of a lot of these things aside from the existence of the media themselves um, and maybe the magazines that they were published in. So, Cone. Now the graphics demo. It's going to draw a 3D cone, presumably. And we've got some shading going on. Yeah, very very nice effect there. Nice metallic effect with lots of lots of different shades of grey. So you see the pixels in this uh, screen display are quite large. So this is one of the Atari's lower resolution graphics modes. So generally speaking on the Atari 8 bits, the lower the resolution, the more colours you can have. So the high-res mode that we've seen with some of these demos is, is just two colors. It's the background color and the foreground color. Whereas this, because it's much lower resolution, you've got all those different shades you can choose from. And they don't have to be shades of gray. They can be that many different colors if you want to as well. Very nice. Oh, it's still going. Oh, it's going around the back. It's doing like a, a transparency effect. That's very cool. Very clever indeed. Yeah, look at that. Lovely. Is this one going to animate? No, it's just going to change color. But yeah, there, there you see, you can have... Doesn't have to be black and white. It could be different shades of purple, green, orange, whatever. All right, who did this one? 
Author unknown, modified by Gary Francis. So the Atari computer enthusiasts of New South Wales were very busy this uh, this with, for this disc. Again, look at that. That's just that's done in six lines of basic. Six lines of basic. All right, just a few more to go. Dizzy is our next one. Is this going to be another headache-inducing one? Let's find out. So slightly higher resolution mode here. But again, one that there's scope to use a few different colours in. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five different shades of pink. Is that going to go swirly? Atari computer enthusiasts of New South Wales. There it is. Look at that. Lovely. And again, that effect probably just accomplished through colour cycling. But it makes for quite a convincing, quite a convincing sort of quasi 3D effect. Again, if we look at the listing. Gary Francis again. Oh, that one's a bit more complicated. Again, I, I won't analyze that right now but if you do want to have a look at that for yourself it's just on disk one of the basics public domain library so just load it up in atari basic for yourself and fiddle around with it <coughs> next munchers Instructions? Yes. <coughs> stay away from the munchers. If you get too close, they will chomp you. 30 chumps and you've had it. Also, stay away from the border. It's electrified and you will fry if you hit it. The longer you last, the higher the score. Reach a thousand and you've mastered the munchers. One problem, though. The longer you last, the faster everybody moves. You're the squat dog-eared guy. Move by using a joystick in player one position. Press trigger to start. All right. Initializing... Okay, so it's, it's, it's just a very simple dodge him up sort of game. So I'm controlling the pink one. And the munches, you can see, are bouncing in fairly predictable patterns. And so you just need to stay clear of them for as long as you can, gradually scoring points and the game gradually accelerating as you do that. And that's literally all there is to this game. But again, this, this was probably put together as an example of how you can use things like joystick control, how you can create custom characters, how you can use different colors on screen. So yeah, this, this, this may not be brilliant as a game or anything, but it's got value because you'll be able to learn something from the listing of this. If you pick this listing apart, you will learn how to make those character sprites. You've had it. You learn how to make those sounds. You learn how to do joystick control, all sorts of things. So yeah, good stuff. Okay, and those um, glitchy things there, that's a sign that the characters in this were using player missile graphics, uh, which are the Atari's built-in hardware sprites. Um, so yeah, if you don't sort of disable those correctly after you've um, quit out of a basic program, you end up with these graphic glitches on the screen there, which are the Basically, the sort of remnants of the sprites. So you can see the, the different colours you've got there. You've got the pink one, which is the player one, and then the three different colours for the um, the enemy sprites. All right. Reboot. We must be nearly there now. Back demo. Popping the camera around again, excuse me. So 
So this will be taking a moment to initialize to, um, oh, there we go, to sort of create the graphics. Set up any sprites and that sort of thing. So again, we're making use of the Atari's high res mode here. Two colors, small pixels, relatively speaking. So this is presumably a demonstration of how to take pieces of graphics and move them around the screen. Is the Pac-Man going to eat them? Yep. Here he comes. Bless. <laughs> Good work. Yeah, so I, hopefully you can, you can see the joy of these discs. It's, some of the stuff in here is just it's just people pissing around with their computer, but that was a part of the computing culture. People just made stuff, even if that stuff wasn't sort of useful or playable. They just made stuff. It was it was a a creative thing to do. What should I do with my computer today? Oh, I'll make it make a little demo of Pac-Man going across the screen and then belching. Why not? Scrambled eggs. Press start button to start the game. You stick one and move man to catch eggs. Missing 12 eggs ends the game. Okay. <laughs> okay, you got to be quite accurate then. Again, not an amazing game or anything, but there will be some programming techniques that you, you would be able to learn from this. Such as how to make those little eggs move down the screen, how to do a very large sprite, large multicolored sprite, in fact, like the man there. Sound effects, collision detection. Mixing graphics modes on screen. Yeah, don't think we necessarily need to spend any more time on that, but uh, yeah, if you, if you look, the man's still sitting there, so he, he's obviously a, a player missile graphic. And if we go back to graphics mode zero, there you are. There's the there's the play missile graphics glitching away again. So let's reboot, get rid of those. Possibly finally, we have colours. So here come some stripes of various different colours, and I think it's going to do something clever with these, like sort of display um, more colours than you'd normally have on screen. There we go, look at that. 256 colours, don't you know? Um, yeah, so this is quite a common programming trick. So like the Atari is only supposed to so support certain numbers of screen colours on screen at once. But with various 
bits of trickery like this, you can get it to display up to 256 at once, which is very clever. But yeah, again, that's literally all that is. And again, some use of player missile graphics there to accomplish various things um, because the player missile graphics are independent of the uh, the current graphics mode's color palette. Right, I think that's everything. Um, but let's just go back to the menu one last time and just make sure. colors and then we're back to Miriam okay so that is everything on disc one of the page six public domain library as you can see each disc tends to have quite a lot of stuff on there because a lot of this stuff is very short little basic programs but of all of those in fact if we go to DOS we can see so if we do a directory on the disc if you look at the number after each one, that's how many sectors on the disk that the uh, that each file takes up. So you can see of those, Myria is the largest one, which you would expect for it being a, a full-on machine code game. Civil War is quite large, um, probably because of all those data statements for all the different um, all the different battles and so on. Uh, Lunar Lander is quite large. Mastermind quite small. Spirals, logo, shell, ball, cone, all of those very small because those are just a few lines of basic. Uh, munchers quite large and yeah so there you have it all right so um we'll wrap that up for today largely because my camera's battery is starting to run out and but i mean we've gone through everything on the disc i hope you enjoyed that this is something i want to do a bit more often because it's the side of the atari 8-bit that i don't think gets talked about nearly enough so i'm going to go through some more of these discs some of page 6's issue discs some of the software that page 6 released um as sort of well i guess it was commercial software um and various other things as well so i think this is a really interesting side to the atari 8-bit that deserves a bit more a bit more scrutiny uh, so please look forward to some more of those for now though i just remains for me to say as always thank you very much for watching and i'll see you again next time